St. Paul says to the Corinthians, as we heard in the second reading this fifth Sunday of Ordinary Time, brothers and sisters, if I preach the gospel, this is no reason for me to boast. For an obligation has been imposed on me, and woe to me if I do not preach it. Before I continue, I'd like to say three things. One, if you voted for Joe Biden in the presidential election, please don't walk out on this homily. Never put your politics above your faith. Besides, this homily is not a political homily. Two, if you voted for Donald Trump, please do not applaud this homily. You know, we really shouldn't applaud uh, homilies. It's, it's really not good for a priest's humility. I know Catholics do it because, you know, sometimes, you know, words are said that really speak to us, and we want to, we're not Baptists, so we don't say, amen, praise the Lord, brother, oh yeah, we don't do that, so we go <laughs> like that, and, and it's, you know, I, we understand, but what happens the next Sunday when you don't applaud the priest? You know, he starts thinking, was that a bad homily? You know the, 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 the poor Claire nuns in Tonopah, where for years I was out there almost every Sunday helping them to say uh, Sunday Mass? They must have a policy where they do not even say, hey, good homily. They mention nothing about the priest's homily. I think the Mother Superior trains the nuns and says, it's not good for a priest for us to congratulate him. So as good as my homilies were, they would just stand there, and uh, after Mass, they wouldn't even mention it. You know, only once one of the nuns came by me after we were cleaning up after Mass, and she went like that and stuff. <laughs> and I'm sure if Mother Superior found out, she'd be doing penance. <laughs> Three, some of what I'm going to share today is violent. And so if you have young children here, make your decision as to whether or not what they may hear uh, is too violent. For them, I'm going to tone it down the best I can, and I'm going to leave out some of the more grotesque parts, but a bit of it may be violent. In the spring of 1993, I was living in eastern Hungary, close to the border of Romania, as a member of the United States Peace Corps, which is a, a department of the United States State Department. A conference had been planned uh, to invite uh, members of the State Department, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, uh, members of uh, different groups, political groups, uh, economic groups, uh, in countries like Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, Ukraine, some of the other Eastern European countries that were coming out of 40 to 70 years of communism. And this symposium was designed to bring many of us together to listen to lectures and to speak about important uh, events and ideas about how to help some of these countries you know, embrace democracy and face some of the new economic principles and such. Well, it was held in Krakow, Poland, which is in the south of Poland. Now, we went there for the conference, but just 50 kilometers southwest of Krakow is the town of Auschwitz. And that name should be familiar with you. You've studied history, you've seen Schindler's List, other movies, documentaries. You know what happened in Auschwitz, one of the most famous Nazi concentration extermination camps during World War II. The camp is located just a few miles outside of the city of Auschwitz. And so while we were in Krakow one day, a group of us Americans decided to go and visit the uh, concentration camp where you can go and see what remains in the museum and such. And so we took a city bus, and it's about a two-hour drive perhaps out there, and we went and we viewed the camp. And we saw 
what you may have seen in documentaries, you're left somewhat speechless. After we had seen the camp that afternoon, we went to the bus stop outside the camp. The collective conversation amongst the Americans was, how in the world could such a thing have happened? How could people have tolerated this who knew about it? The town is only just a few miles away. Surely they saw the train boxcars going in with people on them and the people not coming back. You know, they say that one July it snowed there in that town. That snow fell from the sky, but it wasn't snow. It was the ashes from the crematoriums that were working overtime, burning the bodies of the murdered dead we asked ourselves, how in the world could such a thing have happened? Little did I know that in about 45 minutes I would get my answer. For the bus arrived and we got on the bus and it was very crowded, not just with tourists, but other people who needed to take the bus into the city. And we drove along. I sat in the very back of the bus with some of the other Americans, really tight in the back seat there where it's about six across. And it was nice and snuggly and stuff. And I just drifted into sleep as the bus roared on. Until I was awakened with the shout of a young girl saying, Stop it! Leave me alone! It was the voice of an American girl. I immediately woke up and looked down the aisle of the bus and in the middle of the bus, because it was too crowded, people were standing in the middle, there was a man who was drunk with his, I'm going to say, nine-year-old son. And that image really has never left me of the poor little boy who had this leather briefcase of his father's that was just filled with papers and stuff. And the, the man was bothering this one American girl. He was playing with her hair and trying to touch her, you know, her body and stuff. And she was, stop it, leave me alone and stuff. And the poor little boy is going, Papa, Papa, stop. I don't speak Polish, but there are situations where you don't need to know the language. I immediately got up and walked down the aisle. Now, I'm not going to get and punch the dude. I just got in between him. I squeezed myself in between him and the girl, and I just stood there, and I told the girl, don't worry, he's not going to bother you. I'm not going to let him, and I just kept pushing him back so that, but he kept trying to reach over me and then sucker punching me, you know, in the back because he just, this guy just, you know, wanted to molest this girl, and he was all drunk, and she's like, come on, knock it off. The bus driver, hey, knock it off back there. I'm going to pull over and knock, you know, let you go and stuff. Again, I don't speak Polish, but I'm sure that's what he said. <laughs> the guy continued to do it, and somebody else yelled out in Polish, hey, leave that girl alone. And the bus driver just went, Ey! finally, got up out of his bus seat, came back, grabbed the man, and just dragged him and forced him, opened the door and pushed him out of the bus. Then he grabbed the little boy and took him out, and the boy had dropped the briefcase. He threw the briefcase. I remember the papers just went all over the place. The poor little boy was just out there gathering the papers. Oh, we got to get to the city. Come on. Come on, please. Stop. Please let my papa come on the bus. And it was just heart-wrenching to see this. The bus driver got on the bus, started it, and started going. But the drunk man ran and jumped into the bus. And the man shut the door on him and was dragging his feet. And so he stopped again. And he just pushed him out and said, get out of this bus. And he had to get out of the bus to just get him away so he could jump on the bus and take off. The problem was where the bus driver had stopped was in front of a kochma. Now, kochma, at least that's a Hungarian term, is a bar. It's not a sports bar. It's a tough bar, tavern. It's a drinking place. Women don't go to kochmas. This is a place for men, men who want to drink and get drunk. Well, out of that kochma came three Polish men. One of them was very large. I'd say 6'3", 270 pounds. Remember, he had bald head. This guy was big. The other two rats that were with him were good-sized guys as well. When they came out of the coachman, they began walking up to the bus. They took the side of the man and the son who had been kicked off the bus. And they began to pummel the bus driver and beat him as we just looked out the window. 
They've hit him so hard at one point that he fell to the ground and he was on all fours on the ground like a dog sitting there. Now here's one of the violent things. Have you ever seen a, a field goal kick in football where they hike the ball and they hold it and the kicker takes a running kick at the ball? While that man was down there on all fours, one of those rats backed up and just let it go to the man's head. His neck flew back, the blood just splattered flying, the man rolled down into a ditch. At that point, I just couldn't stop myself. I said, all American men off the bus! And I ran off the bus to confront this situation that was turning into attempted murder. And I looked back, two guys got off the bus with me. Two guys. We're going to get our butts waxed here. Now, I have been able to talk my way out of just about every fight in my life. I think twice I was in a fight. Once I got jumped as a teenager by three guys. Unfortunately for them, my two older brothers weren't too far away, so when they saw it, they came and we unwound some clocks that day. But I'm not a fighter. And I look back at the bus and I see all these faces in the window and I'm like, like gesturing, come on! And they just stood there. And I'm like, man, we're, we're going to get killed here. I don't know how by the grace of God we just kept our distance from those three hooligans and went down into the ditch to pick up the bus driver who was nearly unconscious with just blood just pouring out of his head and out of his nose. And then we even grabbed the, the, the guy, the drunk and the little boy and just said, you know, we'll get him back on the bus. We're just going back on the bus. We got to go. They probably thought, uh, you guys, you know, they probably laughed at us and stuff and just thought, you know, you're not even worth it, you scrawny guys, chickens. And they, we got our, on the bus. The bus driver was able to get on the bus and get going. I think later the police came or we went to a police station or something. And I went back to my seat in the back of the bus and sat down. I was furious. I didn't want to talk to nobody. Good God, 45 minutes ago, everybody's asking, how in the world could Auschwitz have happened? How could they have stood by and let that happen? And then this happens, two guys get off the bus with me. Man, I was peeved. When we got to Krakow that evening, there was a big cocktail party with all the representatives of the different governments and stuff. Man, I didn't want to go to that. I didn't want to be around anybody, especially my American brothers. So I went walking around Krakow that night, just thinking, God, how can things happen like this? Well, you told me, all right. And I went to a church and sat down, and I just said, I'm ashamed. We're Americans. We understand freedom. We've learned. Some, you just got to do the right thing sometimes, at whatever the cost is. And I just sat there in shame. Brothers and sisters, it's 30 years later. And it's still snowing outside. It's snowing with the ashes of the innocent unborn. More of them are being killed every year in the United States of America than the death camp of Auschwitz killed in its entire five-year history. Every year after year after year. Oh, it's snowing outside. And on top of that, we've just recently elected a Catholic president, and he is Catholic, he's baptized, he is a member of the family. We've just elected a Catholic president who is diametrically opposed to all of the basic moral principles that are proclaimed by the Roman Catholic Church. Not only abortion, and the sanctity of human life, but the sanctity of marriage, and this gender silliness. How in the world did that happen? A Catholic. I'll tell you, if he wasn't Catholic, I probably wouldn't be so upset. He's a member of my family. He's the most powerful man in the world. 
And he is absolutely opposed to the basic understanding that God is the author of life. How in the world did this happen? You want an answer? I'll tell you the answer. Because our bishops have been silent for 60 years through bad catechesis and cowardice. They have barely said a thing. A few papers here and there. They speak of, there's things they could do. You say, well, why don't you do something? I'm just a little diocesan priest. I'm a grunt. They're the apostles. They have the voice. I just work for them at their privilege. They can get rid of me tomorrow. How have they allowed this to happen? What is it that they really believe? How poorly have they educated you? Good Lord. Can you imagine if in 2012, Mitt Romney, who was running for president, Mitt Romney, who was a Mormon, a member of the LDS Church, when he was running against President Barack Obama, if he were a cigar-smoking, whiskey-drinking, coffee-drinking Mormon, can you imagine if he had won the presidency? The Mormon Church would have gone apoplectic. This is, this is not a representation of us. They just would have said, oh, no, 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 no. No, don't, don't look at him. He does not represent what we believe. Probably would have excommunicated him. But what do our bishops do? They just let it snow. I apologize if it sounds like I'm yelling at you. I am angry. It's a righteous anger, the same righteous anger that Jesus had when he drove the money changers out of the temple. He didn't hate those people, but he was outraged with a sense of righteous anger. Righteous anger means I am incensed at what you are doing to someone else, and I am called to protect. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. I have to stand up for this. Jesus had to stand up for his father's dignity, so he wanted a clean house. And I have this righteous anger. I'm just tired of this. Angry to the point where I am tempted to say this. If you are pro-abortion, I am tempted to ask you to leave St. Henry Parish. Leave this parish. Tempted to say that. Because then I think, where would you go? This is not just this parish that teaches this. This is the Catholic Church, the Holy Catholic Church of God that teaches this. What parish would accept your views? Sadly, you would find one. And that is an indictment against the bishops. But God help that parish that would let your ideas foster in their parish. And so instead, I will not ask you to leave. Why? Because this may be your only chance to repent, to change your mind, and to come to know the truth and finally embrace it. So I won't ask you to leave. This is your chance for salvation. You are welcome here. Even if you're pro-abortion. But your ideas are not welcome here and they will be given no quarter the same with Joe Biden. He's a Catholic. He's a member of the family. If for some reason he would be in Buckeye on a Sunday, Joe Biden is welcome to come to Mass here. His ideas are not welcome here. And if you ask me a follow-up question, would you give him communion? No. Over my dead body. Not until he repents. He's a public figure. He needs to publicly repent. And we need to pray for his conversion. He is a member of the family. I will ask you this, though, if you're pro-abortion and you choose to stay, don't give us any money. Keep your money. Why? Because I'm an honest priest. And I want you to have some smidgen of integrity. Why in the world would you give money to an organization whose ideas are contrary to what you believe. Don't give money to this parish. Don't give money to any Catholic charity, any Catholic organization. Why would you do such a thing? 
I hate Planned Parenthood and what they do. I hate the fact that the government funds this private organization to continue evil at my expense as a taxpayer. Oh, I do pay taxes. <laughs> Can you imagine if I gave money to Planned Parenthood? Why in the world would I do such a thing? So if you're pro-abortion, keep your money. We are within target of perhaps in five years completing our parish campus. You see all the, the what, it's exploding around us. This is all good, good for us. We're moving on building a church. And if I'm going to build the church, I'm going to build the greatest Catholic church in the Diocese of Phoenix. I'm not going to just build some place where we can hang out. We have a hole right now. We just hang out here, okay? But what I'm going to build is going to cost $10 million. I'm not kidding you. 10, maybe 12. And it's going to be great. Otherwise, I'm not putting my name on it. You can get any priest to build a box for you. But I'm not going to build it with the money from pro-aborts. I'm going to build it from the money from people of faith who believe in what this church teaches about the most basic principle Students in Christ, I feel like a university professor of literature who wants to teach you about Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace or Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment or any other great literature. But about half the class doesn't even know how to read or write. How in the world can I teach you about the beauty and the truths that, are, that lay hidden within Shakespeare when you can't even read it. i got to go back to kindergarten and first grade to start all over. And it's the same thing with this issue on life. we got to get over this hump, brothers and sisters. Can we please just get this down and just say God's the author of life. We have no right to mess with that life, to play with it, let alone end it because of some reason under the sun that it just doesn't fit us. Please. We say, I believe in one God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. That the Virgin Mary conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't care if you believe that. I don't care if you believe in the Trinity. I don't care if you believe in the resurrection of Christ. If you can't get the basics down, I don't care that you believe in life everlasting. Satan can say the creed with us. Lucifer can stand up here and say, because he does believe that there is one God. He knows that. He can say almost the entire creed with us. So big deal that you can say it. Not impressed. Unless there's a difference. Unless that creed and that belief motivates us in what we think and do and say in this world in the way that we envision our lives and the meaning and the purpose. And if we can just get to that basic idea that God is the author of life and we simply, it's not in our job description of what God gave us to do to make decisions that would harm the innocent. Brothers and sisters, if you're pro-abortion, I got nothing for you. I got nothing for you. Nothing I can share with you about Scripture, about the life of Jesus Christ, about the history of the church, about the world that we're waiting for, about the reason that we... I got nothing for you. I'm wasting my time up here. If you just can't get that first thing down, please, can't you see I am begging you? Don't you get it? I don't want any of you to grow up, you young people, to become abortionists. I do not want any of you girls to have abortions and to suffer from the trauma that they don't want you to speak about, that women who have had abortions are haunted with. I don't want any of you boys taking your girlfriends or paying for your wife or forcing your daughter to get an abortion. I don't want any of you young people to grow up to be judges or to be lawyers and enact laws that will further the desecration of the sanctity of life. And I do not want you to vote for political candidates who tell you to their face 
that they're in favor of killing the innocent. Students in Christ, I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm not asking you to join anything. You don't have to be a protester. I'm just asking, can we please just get over this first speed bump? Can we just do that? You know, if we just do that and just say, yeah, life is sacred. If we could just, all of us Catholics, do you realize the force that will be unleashed? If we just say, no, no, bars hold. I, I'm not, we're not doing this. If we could just believe that, watch everything else happen. Watch it all fall together, but we got to believe that first. I'm not asking you to go out and do anything. But brothers and sisters, for Father Billy Costco, the worm has turned. <laughs> And yes, it's largely motivated by the fact that the most powerful man in the world is a Catholic. And his actions squash my little puny voice. Oh, the worm has turned. You may say, oh, are we going to lose the funny Father Billy? That's not possible. <laughs> my sense of humor is sewn into my soul, so... But I got to get off the bus. Man, it is snowing outside. And you know what that is. It ain't snow. And you know where it's coming from. So I got to get off the bus. And I'll probably get my butt kicked, but it's the right thing to do. I just hope this time more than two guys join me. God help us. Don't, don't applaud. We need to hang our heads in shame. We have tolerated this for too long. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, substantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. This kingdom will have no end. And the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us now turn to our Heavenly Father and in Cry out to him with the prayers of our community as we pray to him through our Savior Jesus. As we pray for an increase of vocations to the priesthood and religious life, we ask you, Lord, for peace in our nation, we ask you, Lord, for courage to share, explain, and defend our faith, we ask you, Lord, for married couples who place their love in God's hands, we ask you, Lord, for our friends who have asked us to pray for them today for their material, emotional, and spiritual needs, we ask you, for our own personal intentions, which we carry in our hearts at this Mass, we ask you, and now let us join together as we pray the prayer for a new parish home, 
Lord, help us in our endeavor to build a new home. Enlighten us to see how you are leading us, both as a church and as a family. Through the intercession of St. Henry, we ask for guidance and inspiration during this journey of faith so that the fruit of our labor may live on for many generations. Amen. Please be seated as we now enter into the liturgy of the Eucharist. 